Okay, I am back in a different place, so the lighting and the setting is different, but as I said before, I am not going to worry too much about the aesthetics, and hopefully when you are watching the uh, videos or the podcasts, um, that's not an issue. Okay, so let's look at uh, some of the biases that models have. Uh, when we talk about climate communication, we always worry about using words like bias and uncertainty because the um, laypersons can misinterpret them and think models are bad. Uh, the best way to think about it is that we build a model, it has atmosphere, ocean, land, vegetation, carbon. Depending on the complexity of the model, it simplifies a few things. But given the energy coming from the sun at the top of the atmosphere, these models, the climate models, coupled ocean, land, atmosphere models, maybe with additional details like vegetation and carbon or without them, they can produce uh, pretty much everything we know, the monsoons, the weather, the uh, ocean circulation, atmospheric circulation, precipitation, snowfall, etc., etc. And then they have a little bias because sometimes there are process understandings uh, that are missing, like the microphysics of cl uh, clouds, uh, where you actually literally going from molecules of water to planetary scale processes, and they are not well understood or well represented, but the understanding continues to improve. So when we say biases, we have to be careful that we are not saying we don't know what we are doing or we are not uh, saying models are bad, but we need to be honest and identify where the models um, have some uh, deficiencies compared to observations. So this uh, paper that uh, came out in Climate Dynamics in 2017 did a comprehensive job of uh, uh, documenting the biases in the monsoon domain and again one has to be careful because monsoon is within the, the larger dynamic system so the biases in the monsoon are related to all sorts of other uh, biases elsewhere as well for example the ITCZ which is a global pattern uh, can be biased. Uh, Atlantic Ocean biases tend to have uh, reversed temperature gradients in the deep tropics in the Indian Ocean The compared to observations. In the Indian Ocean, the thermocline gradient is reversed compared to observations. In the Pacific Ocean, uh, the sea surface temperature gradient from east to west may be uh, too strong and the ITCZ may have a strong zonal uh, orientation in the southern hemisphere compared to the observations which has a much more uh, southwest, uh, northwest to southeast tilt and so on and so forth and they can influence the monsoon. Anyways, this paper looks at a number of models here including some data. Uh, this is a temperature data, Aphrodite and crew or rainfall data uh, and also there is NCEP, NCAR which is a reanalysis product where we mix da data with the models uh, to reproduce the past history of climate. Uh, you can think of it as a dynamic interpolation. The data have some gaps in time and space, but we can use a dynamic model and blend the two with uh, uh, techniques called data simulation, which I have podcasts on that you can look up. And that gives us a, a more gridded uh, data set. But the reanalysis themselves also tend to have biases because uh, they are not necessarily conserving some quantities like mass and energy because you are shoving data as the model is integrating forward and that can perturb uh, the balances. Uh, just the scale here, the red reddish colors are fewer uh, models uh, agreeing on things and the dark blue colors uh, get into number of models which agree with uh, each other in the representation uh, we are going to look at. So let's look at the uh, precipitation uh, se a seasonal cycle, annual cycle uh, or the Indian domain and within that there are uh, uh, lines of data as well. Typically the black line in these is always a data, but 
it doesn't even matter which is data because we will focus more on the range of solutions produced uh, in the annual cycle of precipitation and temperature uh, by these models uh, annual cycle computed over this period of 1970 to 1999 and you can see that the range is quite massive right so you are going in the range of uh, minimum of about 3 to 4 millimeter per day to more than 10 millimeter per day and think about the diabetic heating that's involved uh, in producing this amount of rain and what it may mean for global circulation so that's something to keep in mind uh, as I said before and models in general do temperatures much better precipitation is always a, a problem as we said before because of the understanding because of representing deep cumulus convection with parameterizations which are based on limited data the data may come from land or ocean and we are uh, there are local data local information uh, about the relations that we are parameterizing into global domain and so on and so forth this field of understanding the biases is very vast and there are literally thousands of papers we're just trying to summarize here so you can see that the the range here with in the temperatures is tighter um, but still some of them don't even get the seasonal cycle of the cooling that happens during the peak monsoon season because of the rainfall the drawdown of the dry air from the top of the atmosphere towards the surface and so on and so forth okay so we have to keep these in mind and we have to try to see what these biases in the historic simulations mean for the projections so we'll see some of that uh, in a minute so this is something called the monsoon dynamics where uh, as we said before the tropospheric temperature gradient from the ocean to the land matters uh, for uh, the monsoon dynamics and it's positive in the beginning of the year switches when the monsoon onset happens and then it uh, goes back to being positive during the withdrawal and you can see that there again the model range is quite large and Sepencar is in this uh, one of these lines but you can see the range is quite large corresponding to this range here in precipitation and this is called the vertical uh, shear, so easterly shear is critical for uh, basically it's related to strength of the monsoon but it is also important for the uh, pr propagation, northward propagating systems, what we call mesos monsoon interseasonal oscillations which are related to the active break periods and the monsoon depressions and so on, which also have uh, a large range, okay uh, the number of models with onset within plus minus two pentads of the observed pentad is a five day period and you can see again the l low number of models here and the high number of models here and the onset typically when we say monsoon onset uh, we look at the rainfall over Kerala in the beginning of June uh, end of uh, May but the as the monsoon trough propagates northward uh, onset happens uh, along the way I in different places at different times so you can see that there are very few models which ab uh, agree with observations in this uh, region here but here more models agree with each other and here more models agree with each other so then you have to wonder what that is related to and or the uh, uh, East Asian region going into China more models agree here, fewer models agree here, more models agree over Andaman, Nicobar and the ocean domain and so on. So this is a combination of uh, dynamic circulation biases and thermodynamic biases of vertically integrated moisture transport coming in and the southwesterly jet and the return flow here from the Bay of Bengal and so on and so forth. Uh, topographic representations here and the Western Ghats are always problems in these low resolution models but we will look at the impact of resolution in a minute. Um, okay so you can also look at it in terms of temperature bias and precipitation bias and you can see that the uh, larger temperature bias leads to larger precipitation bias on the negative side so typically models have what is called a dry rainfall bias so they are raining less on land typically so you can see that over this large temperature bias range a lot of models have negative bias uh, whereas as the temperature bias reduces they head towards uh, this um, 
positive bias in rainfall, but the correlation is fairly high between the precipitation bias and temperature bias. Uh, if you look at onset percentage of grid points with onset within plus minus 10 days, so you look at all the grid points and the onset days at that uh, grid box, and you can again see that a uh, number of grid points uh, agreeing uh, is fewer than there is a huge negative bias. So you are taking uh, onset at each grid point and looking at relation with all India rainfall. So obviously the propagation of the monsoon trough uh, and the onset at each grid box has a relation with how much that model tends to rain uh, when you consider all India uh, rainfall. Okay, and as uh, uh, the number of grid points with onset agree, then the models head towards the uh, positive biases, which has to be related to this because precipitation on land in general tends to cool the temperatures and whether temperature biases are higher at the warmer end or the colder end uh, has to be looked at and also how that is related to the amount of rainfall produced by the model and what that means. So you have onset, withdrawal, length of the rainy season, number of rainy days, duration, intensity and frequency of rainfall within that. So is there a dynamic consistency within a model between its onset, its withdrawal, its uh, distribution of rainfall in terms of duration, frequency and intensity? That is better looked at in terms of active break spell. So this is from this nice paper by Sharmila uh, and Gang from the Indian Institute of, Institute of Tropical Meteorology. So it's looking at active break spells in terms of short spell and long spell and just the break period in terms of frequency of distribution in short spell uh, and long spell. So uh, you can see that there are uh, there is the observation and so these are historic simulations. There are these model obs uh, observational evident, uh, observational uh, uh, data showing the short spells and long spells, and the models are uh, again uh, all over the place. And the key question is: if a model is closer to observed in active uh, and break. Does it mean it also has a good seasonal cycle, good intraseasonal oscillation, and so on? Turns out that's not always true either. So depending on the metric you look at, a different model can uh, appear better. So it's uh, a beauty context that has to be evaluated in terms of the dynamic consistencies within the model uh, in terms of their uh, seasonal dynamics, interseasonal dynamics, rainfall distribution, and so on uh, and so forth. So you can take that and look at projected changes in uh, active and break spells. So in active spells, you can see that this model, which is closer to short spells, uh, is actually projecting uh, a reduced uh, percentage uh, relative change of uh, active short and long spells whereas this has a higher than uh, observed uh, short active spells uh, but fewer than observed long spells and is projecting increased short spells and decreased long spells. So that's kind of consistent with, uh, consistent with what we know in terms of active periods becoming somewhat shorter and more intense, break spells becoming uh, somewhat less intense and uh, more frequent and so on and so forth. Those are the kind of consistencies you want to look for. Nonetheless, you can see that in the break spells again, the models are not always agreeing well with the uh, observations and they produce very different projections. So you have to also look for dynamic consistencies in terms of how these models do the tropospheric temperature gradient, what they are doing with aerosols uh, and aerosol direct and indirect impacts and so on and so forth. So the story gets quite complicated but nonetheless there are statistical methods um, that are used to construct properties uh, or probability distribution functions of rainfall uh, at active break time scales, at diurnal time scales, at seasonal totals, and then constrain future projections with uh, observed distributions. Of course, this has also some limitations because you are assuming some kind of an uniformitarian principle that what happened in the uh, 
historic period is going to be the same as what will happen in a warmer world. That is not necessarily true, uh, so one has to be careful about those as well. But you best to think of future projections as what-if scenarios and look at the range of possibilities that uh, the models project based on uh, scenarios that are going into it in terms of energy, land use, population, human activities, uh, renewable energy portfolios and so on and so forth. So keeping all this in mind we will see what the models are projecting for the future uh, in terms of extremes uh, in the next podcast. Okay, um, There are many challenges like soil moisture and its role so when we look at these things that doesn't say much about how the vegetation is uh, represented in the models, how the storage and release of moisture by the vegetation affects the monsoon dynamics in these models and how vegetation and soil moisture themselves are represented in terms of uh, processes of hydrologic processes, soil memory, etc. etc. So a complicated model doesn't necessarily mean it's more uh, accurate uh, but two things we have to look at are the resolution impacts and um, uh, projections and how to interpret uh, the projections and what the range of projections are. Okay?